Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is frustrated by all the publicity surrounding Donald Trump's upcoming trial and reportedly wants to get back to doing what the Manhattan DA always does best, protecting New Yorkers from innocent people of color. Meanwhile, Trump faces the possibility of spending the night in a roach infested jail cell crawling with rats and bed bugs. To prepare himself, he's booked a room at the Trump National Doral Hotel in Miami, notorious for its bed bugs. Donald Trump should be arraigned on Tuesday. The former president will be spared the indignity of dipping his thumb in black ink. And instead, as a courtesy, police will dust Lady Justice's breasts for his fingerprints. I'm not making this up. That is the actual Lady Justice statue outside the New York City appellate courthouse. Wow. Lady Justice is no lady. And uh, I'm going to law school. That's brand new. That was put up in January. Now, think about it for a second. It took 43 years for New York City to finally indict Donald Trump. In Manhattan, the wheels of justice don't turn slowly. They are booted, clamped, and permanently immobilized. Trump should have been sent to Rikers decades ago. I'm convinced that Donald Trump saved Central Park's Woolman Rink as a way of saying thanks to a city that, no matter what crime he committed, always let him skate. It was Manhattan's legal system that created Donald Trump. Manhattan judges and prosecutors conveniently looked the other way, knowing that eventually they would need jobs and favors from Trump and his friends. That's how you can always tell you're in a Trump building. The revolving door is permanently set to spin. Before the casinos, the hotels, and the politics, Donald Trump was illegally evicting the poor and the middle class, emptying out single room occupancies, literally creating thousands of homeless to make room for tacky mob built skyscrapers that, like Trump himself, are ugly on the outside as they are on the inside. But let's all puff out our chest and take a victory lap because Donald Trump was finally indicted. Scoop out your brains with a melon ball and replace the contents with moldy banana pudding. That's my advice. Right now, go scoop out your brains with a melon ball and replace the contents with moldy banana pudding. That way we can all think that in America, no man is above the law. You need banana pudding between your ears to believe that in America, no man is above the law. Yeah. Well, this indictment is a lesson for everyone, right? Even if you've committed only 403,546 federal, state, and local crimes brazenly out in the open, while simultaneously warning judges, prosecutors, and police that if you get arrested, there will be armed attacks against government buildings, there is a distinct possibility that you may or may not be charged with a bookkeeping error that's probably going to get knocked down to a misdemeanor. That's the lesson we can all learn. After all those crimes, maybe you'll get charged with a bookkeeping error. Meanwhile, Donald Trump still wants the Republican nomination for president. A new poll shows his lead has doubled, doubled in the past month, and it could possibly triple once that DA in Georgia indicts him for election fraud. Republicans sure love their bad boys, don't they? You know, the only thing that could help Florida Governor Ron DeSantis right now is getting arrested for killing his wife. And if he gets the electric chair, well, he just might win the nomination. Joining us 
are the Hershenfelds. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is an actual Freudian psychoanalyst, and he's the real deal. And Ethan Hershenfeld, where's the book? I was reading it to somebody. I don't have it in front of me. Oh. Ethan Hershenfeld is the author of Today Is Now. Everybody Today should go now. buy it. And it has the Feldman guarantee, which yeah. is you buy the book, and if you don't love it, I will reimburse you. I, I know what I'd like to talk about, if you don't mind, and that is group dynamics, the tendency of societies or communities or professions who get together and they turn on one another. I have some theories on this. Dr. Hershenfeld, I may be experiencing this myself this month. Would you like to hear what I think before I ask you about this? Would you like me to turn on you? As an <laughs> <laughs> okay, talk. Go ahead. Talk. I, the, I have had an experience with a, a community that I'm a member of, founding member of, where some people have turned on each other and me. And I look around and I think, if only Dr. Philip Hershenfeld were here, he would say, and this maybe this is delusional on my part, there are other problems in your lives, but this is the only thing you can control, fighting with me. Are you talking about congregation Ahavat Shalom? <laughs> Sounds like, is that where, where you're experiencing this? Oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, has there ever been a group, a community, a, a, a rock band that gets along? The Beatles were all about peace and love and come together. It took years for John and Paul to reconcile, to get back together. And Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, your, your thoughts on community dynamics, please. My thoughts are, it is very complicated. I don't think there is one simple explanation. Some of the explanations are sibling rivalry in any group. Another explanation is that the group is somehow uh, under pressure from the external world. Let me explain what it is. The, the, the problem is that in any group, the main problem is this. You have the meeting and then the food, and that's very upsetting for people. You have to have the food first and then the meeting, and then you can avoid all of this. stuff. Everyone's just sitting around and someone's talking and you're thinking, oh, God, I really want some of that food. And then they wait and they wait. And if they would just give you the food first and then the meeting, none of this would ever happen. Dr. Hershenfeld, makes sense. Did I tell you, I think I did, the story of Picasso's father? Yes, but repeat okay. it. It bears, bears repeating. Picasso, he produced a bunch of portraits, you know, representational portraits in his early teen years. And they were so good that it is said that his father put away his paintbrushes upon seeing them. So what can I say? Yeah, but that works for you. He's your son. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> He's Let me a rival. Let say something about that, that Picasso also. This is something that people don't realize, the art historians don't realize. Picasso's mother actually had two eyes on the same side of her face. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't doing anything revolutionary. He was just looking at mommy and, and painting her. So <laughs> she, was, she was half flounder. <laughs> <laughs> she was half flounder? Yeah, yeah. I, I, see, I'm glad I uh, learned that. Uh, so going back to group dynamics, temples, you know, there is the story of the two temples in Afghanistan where they don't get along. There were two Jews left in Afghanistan. And yeah. it's the old joke. That's a temple. What's the second? Te that's the temple I would never step foot. I mean, they were at each other's yeah. throats. That's not a Jewish trait, that's a human trait. Yes. Jews just do it a little bit louder, perhaps. But uh, but we, we why can't, I hate to say Rodney King's line, why can't we get along? 
the worst thing that can happen is success, right? If, if a group is successful, any group is successful, they start, right? Don't they just start fighting? Human relations are very complicated. The hardest thing in the world is to have a successful, long-lasting human relationship because we all have these primitive emotions that we keep in check most of the time, but they tend to come out with people that we are most intimate with. Right. Because it's would, safe. It's safe. I would well, also say not that, just because it's safe. Oh, go, go on, doctor. Go on. No, no, then you go on, doctor. <laughs> okay. I'll go on. <laughs> the, the real problem is often not that there is strife in a group. The problem is that you then beat yourself up over feeling aggressive or acting aggressively. Being aggressive towards the ones near you and the ones in your group or the ones in your club is not in itself a problem. I mean, within within certain limits. You don't want to cause any injuries or very, you know, very hurt feelings. But to express your, your aggression is, is completely natural. That's part of, of being alive. And But what really comes into play then is the guilt about that. And I think that, that can be even more damaging. And all the worry, all those secondary worries, oh, did I offend him? Oh, what, what, if, what if that person, what are they going to think about me? There's, I think we should, I suffer from the same thing, David. There's a little bit of a, a conflict. I then think, oh, Jesus, what happened? What did I do? How can I mend? But, you know, People can people have thick skins to a large degree. I think that uh, today is that, opening. It's opening day. I have no joy for team sports. I know Dr. Hershenfeld instilled in his brilliant son a love for team sports. What is it about team sports that portrays the traditional group dynamic, or does it? It's the it's the it's the sports tricks. It's the Gatorade. All of these electrolytes that they're <laughs> pumping into these people. There's no such thing as an electrolyte. An electrolyte is not a thing that anyone should ever drink. And now you have ads and industries and Super Bowl <laughs> minutes taken up on Gatorade and Schmaderade. This stuff will kill you. It goes right into your kidneys. It turns you into the Hulk. I mean, look at the colors of these things. These things are the colors of traffic signals. They're not beverages. They're not meant to be. And they're pumping kids. They're pumping them, their kidneys full of it. They're mm -hmm. pumping their heads full of the idea. And you need protein powder. No, you don't. You don't need protein powder. Just eat a falafel. That's all the protein powder you will ever need. <laughs> these kids and these athletes are just filling themselves with all this horse shit. Right. And it, I think it really does lead to either actual aggression or the feeling of, man, to get my money's worth for this 48 buck dollar bucket of powder, <laughs> I better kick someone's ass. So there's just a lot of, there's a lot of pent up nonsense. Yeah, in, so in team stop sport, with the, stop with the supplements. Stop with the supplements. Just leave them alone. You'll save money, and and you'll 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 save everyone a lot of heartache. Doctor Hershenfeld, I, I I have I'm putting down my pain <laughs> right. What's the opposite of a supplement? Are there any pills you can take that remove zinc and potassium from your system and calm you down? When if I were Reggie Jackson, Mister October, designated hitter, I get up. And I, you know, bottom of the ninth and I win the World Series. Yeah. I'd I'd go back to the hotel room and everybody would call me and I'd say, but I was only up once. All I did, I I I, I didn't I didn't do anything. I'm not, I, I feel left out. This was a humble guy. No, I would you beat know? up on myself and I'd be jealous of my other teammates. I only got like three minutes of camera time. Can I say something else about that, about that Reggie Jackson thing you're talking about. There is a new habit among athletes, especially tennis players. After they hit a good shot, it started with that Dumkopf Djokovic. That, that guy should, should just, he should not have a visa to any country. He's so obnoxious. He started doing this thing. After he hits a winning shot, he goes like this. He touches his ear to the crowd as if to say, I can't hear you. Hear you louder. Really? It's so disgusting. Wow. And now this this Alcaraz, who's now number one in the world, he's doing it also. It is a grotesque, egomaniacal. It, it's just so terrible. And the crowd, I mean, if, if I was in the crowd and, and an athlete grabbed their ear, I would just get up and walk out.
Yeah. Just screw you, okay? You, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, there's too much ego, too many supplements. The, the one thing with Reggie that you got to give him that people don't talk about enough, apart from the four home runs or whatever it was in one game, he got his own candy bar. He was yes. the first guy to ever get that. There was a candy bar, a very underrated candy bar. I ate a lot of candy bars in the 1970s, and I specialized in the in the candy bars that combined chocolate and nuts. In some ratio. <laughs> and then a caramel was okay also. The Reggie bar was the perfect ratio of chocolate, nut, and then just a little, a little bissel of car- caramel. It was fantastic. <laughs> and it came and it went. That should, I say, bring back the Reggie bar. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, did ba- the Bay Bru- there used to be a candy Bay bar Bruce. name. Bay but, that, Bruce. but that was, was that linked to him? It yeah, was, I don't know. I think they were just, uh, it was copyright infringement on his name, and he was dead. He couldn't sue. It was just called a bait. Uh, uh, but maybe it was. I think but it I was. I didn't like, like a, that one. Yeah. It, it had what's called nougat, which isn't even a thing. Nougat. You don't want nougat. <laughs> not fine. Chocolate, can't, but what is nougat? That's the that's <laughs> fake French confection from the revolutionary era. <laughs> okay, so you're on a basketball team. You played basketball for Yeshiva, right? Well, no, he didn't play for Yeshiva. No, you couldn't make the team. Yeshiva varsity team? How hard could it I, be I, to I, make? I, I might have. I don't know. Um, the problem <laughs> when you're playing a basketball in the Yeshiva League, when I was in sixth grade, I, I did make the, the, the seventh and eighth grade team, which was a, a, a great honor. But the problem of playing in the Yeshiva League is a lot of times, Kids are running down the court. They're dribbling. They're on a fast break. Their right hand is dribbling the ball. Their left hand is holding onto their yarmulke. <laughs> it's a terrible. I wish, I wish I was making that up. It's the most embarrassing thing about the Jewish people that I can share with any of the Gentiles in, in your audience. They're literally running down the court, holding onto their. Yarmulke. So then, you know, as defense, you're thinking like, oh, is he going to go left? Well, not that guy because his left hand is on his yarmulke. He's never going to be going left. Here's here's a real life event. When I was in high school, Yeshiva League game, some guy stole the ball, was charging down the court, completely open basket. His yarmulke blew off. No. And he he passed it to a teammate who probably missed it, and he breathed his yarmulke. (laughs) But... A rabbi said, let's say he made the basket. Okay, another basket. Nobody would remember it. But this, (laughs) people will remember forever. And I'm living proof of that. I remember it 50 years later. This guy, guy, he will be mocked for eternity for that. That's right. The basket, they would have forgotten. Not since Moses in the basket have you remembered him. Uh, oh, yeah. hey, uh, but you can drop a yarmulke, right? It's it's not a... But you can't no, keep walking without it. Oh. You got Your head's got to be covered. Come on. Yeah. Oh, yep. I see. Although walking, like nowadays, there's sort of a jump stop and then another step is allowed in basketball. In my day, that was not legal. A lot of the stuff you see online these days would be traveling. So maybe the rabbis have also loosened the rules, how many steps you can take without a yarmulke, just like the referees have loosened the, the traveling rule. Maybe, basketball. maybe. We don't know. Maybe. And in yeshiva, when you get called for traveling, the, your mother screams, did you pack a sweater? It, it could get, <laughs> um, if you were on a basketball team, hypothetically, and your team wins. Yes, you no know, hypothetical here. All right, Dr. Hershenfeld, you go see your son play basketball. I did whenever I could. Okay. The team wins. Rearranged patients, all sorts of stuff. This is in high school. Yeah. Did I ever see you play in college? I don't remember if I ever saw Yeah, freshman year you came once when I played against some other college. Well, you played freshman you played freshman you played freshman basketball in college? Yeah, for the well, big I age. played on the JV team my freshman year. It's nothing to brag about. It's, you uh, played JV at Harvard? It's something to brag about. That's really nothing to brag about. Wow. I brag about it all the time. So I'm going to brag about it. No, there, no it was, it was, um, I was full of shame. I'm covered with shame in how that all, <laughs> all went down. I was not recruited. There were five recruits my year. I had hoped to make varsity. I didn't, and then I played JV, and... I guess um, 
the highlight of my JV career was, and this is a true story. We were playing against a team, and I was uh, covering a guy in a full court press, and he literally said to me, "We're going to kick your Jew asses." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I said, what? What did you say?" And he said, "You heard me." So then. After the game, I see I had the wherewithal, I had the self control to not punch him during the game and get a technical foul or whatever. But I went up to him after the game when there was, you know, the teams would sort of shake hands or whatever. And I and I, I walked up to him and I said hey to him and he turned around and I shoved him, knocked him over. And then there was a little scrum and then the coaches arranged a little official apology ceremony. And the kid came up to me with his coach and this was an apology verbatim. Yeah, sorry about what I said, but you're going to have to get used to that kind of thing. Wow. wow. That was 1986, uh, the fall of 86. And, so and, and you were, the weird ago. thing, Dr. Hirschenfeld, is he was playing Brandeis. <laughs> that's, that's the shocker. <laughs> what, what college were you playing? I, I don't play. remember. Um, yeah, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, anyhow. But you remember that incident, a day doesn't go by, what I should have, no, could have, would have. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I nowadays I probably would have been tossed out of out of school for having shoved the guy. I don't know what would have happened, but uh, I well, kind of regret not clocking him in the nose right when he said it, and then taking the technical and getting ejected because that would have been. But but no, nonviolence is better. Nonviolence so, is better. Well, I have I two questions, Doctor Hershenfeld. Yes, Doctor Feldman. Y your son. Uh, is dealing with an anti-Semite on the basketball yeah. court and he hauls off and socks him. Yeah. As as a psychiatrist, you know it's wrong, but as a father, are you proud or do you still know it's wrong? How do I know it's wrong? Why do you assume that I know it's wrong? Because we don't condone violence, right? Well, I didn't really haul off. It was just a, it was a sort no, of... No, I'm saying you didn't do it. In my estimation, you didn't do enough. Yeah. I mean, I told my son to run away from fights. Yeah. But... Well, I did hit a number of people over the years in exactly those circumstances. And uh, do I feel bad about it? No. I have a couple of scars. But listen, <laughs> could I bring up the topic that yes. I wanted to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I just want your, you yeah. know, your watchers and your listeners to hear about that. Please, everybody go out and buy this week's Time magazine because there is a crucial article in it that I sent to you, David, but maybe you didn't read it. The Bag of if the Yiddishisms. No. Which one was it? I read it. The danger... This is written, it's a letter written by some of the top names in artificial intelligence that we've got to stop it. Remember the Terminator? Yes. That's a real possibility that these Terminator. machines, as they are getting smarter and smarter, and we do not understand how smart they're getting, and we do not understand if or when they are developing consciousness. And, and this letter states that there's a real fear that it will exterminate all biological life on this planet. Well, what, you, you've got, I, I, an can I just, before you say anything, Ethan, yeah. I did read the article. Good. And it's causing me, I'm being serious. Yes. Yeah. I'm not being psychological, like this thing of what is real, who am I, like, how the a sense of isolation and uh, like solipsism where you, the fear of I'm the only real human on the planet. That's which a I, common fantasy. Everybody has had that once in a while. I, I live that. Okay. <laughs> you should see the way. I, but with AI, my mind started going, oh, my God, you can really cut out the world and uh, go ahead, Ethan. It, it is too. No, I thought that the link. I thought that the link that you sent, Doctor, was one to the opposite. That said, the problem is that we that it hasn't developed far enough. Not that it's developing too fast. Wasn't that the link or no? I think what happened was AI messed with the link I sent you. Oh, okay, <laughs> first the whole point because of the. I believe. 
I believe that that's the problem. Like, people were worried a few years about data getting stolen. My data is going to get, I want my data to get stolen. Who the hell is interested in my data? Come, let's do this. People are worried about AI. I'm not worried about AI at all. I think we need more I. There's not enough I in the world. I don't care if it's AI, any kind of I. There's so much stupidity. Let's just bring in more intelligence. I don't care if it comes from animals, from aliens, from computers, from squirrels, from people on the street. I want more intelligence. And frankly, if if the robots win and they exterminate all the people, fine. I, I think we've, we've had our run at the planet. We've done a lot of good and we've done a lot of bad. So it's time to give the robots a turn. That's what I say. Give them their shot. Have okay. you engaged, Dr. Hirschfeld, uh, have you engaged with AI? I was doing it last night. Howie Klein, who does this show all the time, asks AI to write poetry for him. And I played around a little. It's fun. But I, I don't really understand the depths that lead these people to be so concerned. They're well, genuinely you, concerned. Well, you said consciousness. Do you think yeah, that I'm consciousness? Yes, they they are worried that these machines are moving in the direction of consciousness and we won't know it when it tips over and then we're we're done for all living things all carbon-based life forms no matter how small have right. one instinct and that is survival right so i think 2001 with hal they touched on that that the, that the at some point these computers may not have consciousness but the instinct to survive no matter what. Well, they're now talking about consciousness. And well, they already have what to me is very frightening. There's a little fan that goes on in my computer when it gets too hot. Like, mm -hmm. how does it know? That's already very scary. <laughs> it's, it's self, that's like a self-cleaning oven. It's scary. Well, how does the oven know to clean itself? That's just incredible. So this, if it's even scarier than the self-cleaning oven or the right. fan in my laptop, I'm terrified. Okay, I'm going to leave you two to, to finish this up. But okay, you know, God bless. I got to go to my, my, my robot overlord. They're calling. <laughs> bye uh, bye. Unbelievable. Uh, so before you go, what are you reading? No, no, no. I'm reading this damn article in Time Magazine. Well, go on. Right, so go on with the article. I, th I think you have an obligation to the world, to your public, to bring this to, a, to the attention of whoever you can. You've got a, you know, a voice. Tens, tens of listeners. Tens of listeners. And you also have some very important guests, unlike me. That's and it's not why don't you bring it up with them and well, and urge them to do something? I was discussing this on the Ralph Nader show and the question I asked of a doctor, he, 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 he I brought up artificial intelligence this week. Right. And I said, how far away are we from doctors being replaced and pharmacists being replaced and surgeons being replaced by artificial intelligence. And given the shortage, the, the artificial scarcity of doctors, and it is artificial, how bad a thing would it be to be able to get a diagnosis online? That would not be bad at all. There, there, there are good possibilities, but there are some really scary right. possibilities. And the question I had in this doctor didn't, uh, wouldn't address it. And it was given the protocols that are insisted upon by health insurance companies, are doctors going to be allowed to prescribe anything or make any decisions without clearing it first with, you know, Aetna's specific AI chat? Isn't that where we're heading? Probably. Yeah. There are all sorts of things that you need permission for you can't get permission for yeah i once needed this was years ago and i it was not a real problem but my do my doctor wanted a stress test with contrast it's much more expensive with contrast 
So I was sitting in his office when when he he called up whatever insurance company, and uh, he said, "I would like you to approve a stress test with contrast for these various reasons." And the guy on the other end of the phone, who I think was a doctor, said, "Denied." And my doctor said to him, "Could I please have your full name?" and the spelling of it, because when I'm up on the stand in the malpractice suit after Dr. Hirschenfeld drops dead, I would like to get your name right. <laughs> and the guy said, you know what? I think it's okay. You can <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hirschenfeld. I'll see you next week. I hope so. Outdoor Goodbye. dining. Let's plan yeah. outdoor dining. Outdoor dining. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. Thank you, Dr. David Feldman. Ah, my if only my mother were alive to hear that. She's hearing somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Professor Mike Steinell joins us. He is the author of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Go buy Saving Charlie Parker, a novel, right now. Go to MikeSteinel.com and go buy Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. If you don't like the book, if you don't love it, let me know and I'll reimburse you. More importantly, you had a gig yesterday. You have a gig on April Fool's Day. And then you have a gig, I believe, coming up in Denton. At That's right. That's right. Wine Bar, right? Yeah, we we played last night at the Comedy Arena. And I'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about... We kind of did a different kind of show, uh, but then we play also Saturday at the University of Texas at Dallas, UTD. Johnson Hall. Johnson Performance Hall. You can find that easily on the map. Google that. And we start at 730. Uh, I think you can get tickets online or at the door. And then the wine bar, April 19th at Steve's Wine Bar in Denton, Texas. And, uh, you know, uh, those usually sell out. So if you want to go to that, you know, like go online and uh, buy a ticket. I was going to go to something last week on Monday and I got online and it was sold out, but I, they, they squeezed me in. They'll squeeze you in even if it sells out, but you might have to stand, but it was a really great show. Rosanna Eckert's doing a new, uh, she's in my group, the Mike Steinel quintet featuring Rosanna Eckert. But she's, she's got, got a new project with a guy named Jeff Gardner and they did a show at the wine bar and they're going to they're recording as i speak right now they're recording mm -hmm. on thursday maybe they're done by now it's uh seven o'clock here but uh, they're going to do an album and it'll be spectacular just duo for them she's very talented she can do a lot of different but anyway last night we played at the comedy arena which is a really cool small space very intimate intimate and um and what, what city is that? We, McKinney, we, McKinney, McKinney, Texas. And, you know, like a lot of it's McKinney used to be in my mind was just kind of this kind of nondescript like right. suburb over there. But they've really done a lot of revitalization. It's right downtown in uh, in a cool building that's above a, a little bar and, and restaurant. And then you go upstairs, there's a comedy club, but there's all sorts of shops and this is in this historic downtown, but they've it's just full of really cool things, gift shops and and uh, a beautiful courthouse. And it's really quite spectacular. You know, the you know, court I, I remember I remember Texas being a great comedy town. Austin, no, Texas was just a great town for comedy. <laughs> I'm from New York. We, we Texas, we is, Texas a, is a just a it's, little it's, town. <laughs> it's Go a ahead. it's a state, David. Well, I don't care. <laughs> it's I huge. Would, it's a huge. It's the nah, biggest. That's what you think. It's not as big as Manhattan. <laughs> you know, the original plan was for Texas to be seven different states. You knew that, right? Yeah. Because it's it's seven different uh, climates, basically, and and geographies. You know, you got the hill country, and you got like uh, Abilene. That's de right. desert, and we're in high plains and. Uh, Beaumont, Texas is in the east. It's it's piney woods. Uh, Houston is subtropical. It's small 
Potatoes. I'm from Manhattan. You know what we call people from Texas? What? All cattle, no hat. That's a good. That's a good phrase. That's You're all phrase. cattle and no hat. Sure, you got a lot of land, but what's underneath the hat? You know, uh, I was reminded of. Uh, let me love, first of all. Let me back. I up. love Texas. Let me just say, I okay. love Texas. I hate the government. Texans. Of Texas. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of Texans I'm not too crazy about. Yeah. And some of them and most of them are in the government. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were just saying but most you, of them are in, in my living room right now. No, no, they're fine. Um, <clears throat> no I love. I know. You, you know, Denton is different. Austin is different because it's a college town, you know, so yeah. you get the influence of a lot of outsiders. And, um, and you're fighting the fight. It's you know, how hard is it to be a lefty in Manhattan? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you've got it easy, buddy. Yeah. Hey, um, so anyway, last night we did the show and, and we're going to do the same thing on Saturday and probably on the 19th is we do eight songs from the album that's related to Saving Charlie Parker. By the way, there's a website called SavingCharlieParker.com, which okay. shows a lot about the books that I use to research the topic and uh, the, the locations and some fun stuff, you know. Uh, but um, tell us who Charlie Parker was. Before. Charlie Parker. To, yeah. Why was, is Charlie Parker important to you? Charlie Parker was one of the chief inventors of bebop. And bebop is what grew out of swing, the swing era of the 30s. And it was it was revolutionary because of the harmonic density that was added, the chromatic vocabulary, you know, like, you know, um, well, I can show you on the piano, like, uh, you know this song? It's right, right now for the David Feldman show. Well, like a swinger, a musician might go. That's this kind of solo, but mm -hmm. a bebop musician would go. more rhythmic density and harmonic density were were added and the thing about charlie parker he's he just mastered it he was so he could play so much faster than anybody had ever played and he could he had a beautiful tone and and he was just this never-ending stream of uh inventive melodies you know uh, and everything that he did was based on older forms but he just he revolutionized it. So that's who Charlie Parker is. But anyway, where was he, we, where was he born? Oh, he's born in Kansas City, Kansas. And um, kind how of old would, how old would he be today? He born in 1920. So what does that make him? 103. Yeah, 103. There are probably still people around that knew him in the 50s. I'm trying to track down. Uh, for this next novel, I need some resources about what was going on on uh, on 52nd Street. He lived in he lived in um, uh, the Dewey Square Hotel up in in Harlem when he came back to New York after getting out of the hospital in 48. And then he moved to a place called the Marden Hotel, which is at 44th and 7th Avenue. And the front of the hotel is still there. I, I, you know how you can go on Google Maps and look at it? Right. And it looks exactly like the pictures. Uh, and now it's apartments, I'm sure. But he lived how old there. Was he, how old was he when he died? 34. And from? Well, he just, he had a hard life. He was addicted to heroin from the age of 16 because of a car accident. And he was, his back was almost broken, maybe broken cracked and so they he's in a lot of pain they treated him with morphine and he just stayed on it and uh, he was a junkie from the time he was 16 but he was able to function high functioning uh he actually he had more trouble with when he couldn't get uh, heroin or morphine he then and then he he drank and the, it was alcohol mostly that you know that um that got him i think probably more than anything Peptic was, ulcer, uh, bad he, ulcer. Go ahead. Was he, was he able to see his success or did it come 
after he passed. No, he was he was lauded and he won a lot of polls, you know, greatest read. You know, he won the downbeat poll. And actually, he he had financial success because I've if you think about one of the books that I used uh, to research is called the the bird diary. They called him bird. Charlie Parker's his nickname was bird. And that's a long story. But there's a thing called the bird diary, which goes takes his life from like 1942 to 1954, sometimes day by day, certainly week by week and month by month about where he was playing, what was going on in his life. And um, there's a lot in there about the contracts, what he got paid for certain gigs. Hmm. And for the time, it was really good money. But he he was always um, pawn in his horn. I, you know, there's all sorts of stories. As a matter of fact, the book opens in Toronto. When he uh, went up to Toronto to do a concert and didn't bring an alto saxophone. So he has to play the concert on an, a, a plastic alto. He still sounds great. And that's where the book starts at the time. It's a time travel book, um, time travel. And, uh, you know, retired jazz professor falls down in his house, hits his head, wakes up in 1953 mm -hmm. next to Charlie Parker, who's sitting at a bar. And when he should be playing next door at Massey Hall, but it's been kind of a fiasco. And he's playing. He's pissed off because he's playing a plastic alto. And um, but he was always doing that. He was always pawning his instrument. Matter of fact, when he played at the Three Deuces, they hired somebody to kind of shadow him to, you know, like if make sure he had his horn, make sure he wouldn't he wasn't too drunk, you know. And uh, it was a, it's a very sad story. Uh, the movie Bird does a great job of plumbing that that sadness about the thing. Matter of fact, the ending is is pretty brutal, it's brutally sad. But um, it's it's a uh, anyway. So last night, what we did was I read f in front of each two, in front of each song. I read part of the novel and I think it made a nice while the band would play softly, maybe just oh, wow. drums or bass underneath wow. me. So it had atmosphere. Yeah. And you kind of get I, I laced together enough stuff so you get a flow for the, the story. Right. Could you and do that now? I'm going to do that Saturday. And I'm, you mean right now with you? Well, I'll give no. us a, a little bit of a reading. <laughs> um, let me, you know, I, I'm just going to read from the new novel, but. Um, oh, the new novel. Okay. Yeah. People That's can good. go to Audible and they can hear, get the same experience yes. of me reading the novel with music. How do they under, do that? They, they can go to just Mike go to Audible or go to Mike Steinel.com. Mike Steinel.com, saving Charlie .com. There's a button there to per, however you want to buy the Audible. If you want to go to Audible, iTunes or Apple Music. If you want to buy the book on Barnes and Noble or uh, Pender's Music in D Denton, Texas, or, you know, uh, it's it's all there just with links and it'll take you right, right to the page where you can purchase it. But by the but, way, we're talking with Professor Mike Steinel. He's a jazz trumpeter, pianist, composer, arranger, internationally recognized jazz educator, author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, and building a jazz vocabulary, which you should buy if you're a if you're starting out, go buy those books. Or if you're t teaching jazz, you should pick those up. And uh, Saving Charlie Parker is his latest book, and it includes music. If you get the Audible version, including Turtle, which I can't play anymore because I know. Sorry, playing. that's a that's a good one. Oh, Turtle man. is the name of the. Uh... My character's uh, drug connection. He's got to yeah. got to get some Oxycontin. Now, By the I, way, I I am internationally recognized. I was in Sweden with my wife, and we were at the palace at the and at the gift shop at this you know the pal the king's palace. Mm -hmm. You ever been to Stockholm? No. Anyway, I've there's a this, syndrome though. <laughs> there's this big podcast. I think the people have called this podcast Stockholm. Go ahead. There's this big fortified castle and the king, when he's in there, they, they have a changing of the guard. So we were there for that. And we watched it. My wife went into the gift shop and I just walked out. It was a beautiful day. I'm standing in the uh, uh, in the courtyard and way from like 300 yards away, a former student goes, Mike Steiner. Wow. wow. <laughs> so I'm I, so now in my bio, I say I'm internationally. You recognized. are. 
I, I yeah. had a I, can I not that I'm competing with you. No, no, let's compete. Let's go. Th- head this morning, this morning, I was at Yorkville liquor store <laughs> and the guy behind the counter said, I know who you are. And he pointed to the picture of don't cash checks from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah. ah, you're familiar with my work. Yeah. Yeah. You are also you taught jazz. How many years did you teach jazz? Forty. 40 years. I mean, you know, I was teaching it when I was uh, even a student. I was running. Right. They gave me when I was undergraduate, they gave me one of the bands to run because I looked like I could maybe do it, I guess. And you yeah. are also one of the world's foremost experts on Bob Dylan. You're an actual Dylanologist. Don't you have proof that you're? I have Dylan? underwear that says I am. <laughs> hey, you know what? I, I think you really I, do have underwear that's it. You want me to go get it? Well, <laughs> this, bring it, this we're next just time. we're not doing visuals. We're not doing uh, video on this show anymore. Well, we? a little, well, maybe a little. We'll okay, it, all right. Whenever, if it if it's in sync, you know. I speaking of Dylan, I pulled out and, and I have to finish a book. I've started a book years ago because I believe it needs to be written about Dylan, Bob Dylan's voice. It's kind of an apologetic about his voice, not mm-hmm. to apologize that it's bad, but to say it's no, explained. it's it's really good. But anyway, so I was I was going through that. And in the introduction, I there's a part that said uh, it's called uh, what they said, what they've said. So how do I it's just like quotes about Bob Dylan's voice and some, you know, so the, the setup is the book will look at all aspects of Dylan's singing and his singing career, breaking down things into component parts as necessary. It's drawn from a variety of sources and hopefully can be considered a work of fact more than a work of opinion. But meanwhile, here's what people have said. This was from the headline of the London Daily Sketch, no voice, but some singer. This is one I love, John Updike. A voice that you could scour a skillet with. Now, Mm. first of all, that's kind of harsh. And the the grammar's wrong. A voice with which you could scour a skillet. Mm or more poetically, a voice that could scour a skillet, right? Isn't that better? Anyway. Yeah. Take that, John Updike. Yeah. Put that that where the sun don't shine. Right. Right. Here's what Dylan said. I'm just as good as Caruso. You have to listen closely. But I hit all those notes. That's from Don't Look Back. Remember, he's talking to the the news people. This is from Nick Jonas on the Jimmy Kimmel show. Dylan can't sing. (laughs) Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, here's one. Stephen Webb. To put it bluntly, saying that Dylan cannot sing is like saying that Picasso didn't know how to draw. That's Stephen Webb. Really great book called Dylan Redeemed that he wrote. Uh, Robin Hitchcock, another writer for The Word, a, a British music magazine. A corrosive voice, restless, inconsolable, eating through the excuses that humanity feeds itself. I love that. Here's one from the same guy, Robert Hitchcock, Robin Hitchcock. He keeps you company. You put on a Dylan record and by God, you know, someone else is there with you. Hmm. Here's one from Stephen Webb again. Dylan's voice has weight and density. It is substantial enough to connect soul to soul. Its textured surface makes it multidimensional because the ear can discern its various layers which get deeper with each hearing. Here's from uh, Robert Shelton. He'd, the liner notes of his uh, debut album, which was called Bob Dylan. Dylan's voice is anything but pretty. He is consciously trying to recapture, 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 <laughs> <laughs> recapture the rude beauty of a Southern field hand, music in his melody, in his melody. Dylan has the ability to mimic the rhythms of natural speech, speech in his verse. You know, a lot of his things where he will, there's one great one, uh, I think Brownsville girl, where like every other line is spoken rather than sung. And it's really, it's really appealing. You know, you can really follow it. Um, now, if you could. Yes. Meet. If you had to choose. Who do you think would be more interesting to have dinner with? Charlie Parker, Bob Dylan. You have to pick one. Charlie Parker, Bob Dylan, or Doc Severinsen? Um, I know the answer. <laughs> I, 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 there is a correct answer. 
You okay. have to choose Charlie. I would Parker. say Charlie Parker. It's Charlie Parker because I know you know Dylan is is uh, there's not a lot of mystery. I mean he's you know you just listen well, to and him. What would you ask Charlie Parker? What I'd ask him when he first <laughs> the potatoes. <laughs> can, can you pass the potatoes? <laughs> um, now I'd, I'd ask him like when did he get the idea that he could like transcend what was going on? You know was he was he just so dissatisfied someone put the idea you know nothing comes from nothing i think everything is derivative and everybody would tell you that if they're still alive they said well i was just when i started playing i would i mean bob dylan is derivative of um you know uh woody guthrie mm -hmm. um you know any number of modern trumpet players are just derivative of miles davis and miles davis is derivative of Dizzy Gillespie and Dizzy Gillespie right. is de 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 uh, derivative of of um, let me see any you know earlier players Louis Armstrong everybody like there was there's two great players in jazz and if you know about these two you know a lot of jazz and that's Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker wow. everything around them you know in terms of distilling the style you could add Miles Davis and John Coltrane. If you knew the music of those four people, you know a lot about jazz. You know, the trouble this. with Miles is there's early Miles and there's the the l later Miles, like the 60s. And then there's the even then there's the rock and roll Miles, you know, from 80 on when he was doing Cindy Lauper tunes and things like that. Right. So everything is derivative. And I would just want to know, hey, Charlie, like who gave you the idea to do this? Because there isn't a whole lot of people before him. Right. You can kind of see it gradually changing, but he just, he took it and just went off with it, you know? Right. 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 What do you got for us in your new book? Do we have time? Yeah. And then okay, we, well, this yeah. is a time travel. It's going to be murder at Birdland. Okay. I'm going to read. This is chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. This might be a little long, David. Well, why don't we do it next week? Yeah, it's a little long because we got uh, sidetracked here. And uh, but um, let me wait. Let me read a couple more Dave um, Bob Dylan things here. Dylan's voice is especially challenged, challenging to put into words. Many people have tried to come up with funky metaphors to describe his trademark wine. But it's no easy task to analyze with care the complexity of his tone and the surprising delicacy of his range. Hmm. Yeah, right, <laughs> this is this is a good one more. Dylan used to sound like a lung cancer victim singing Woody Jesus. Guthrie. Now he sings like <laughs> he sounds like the Rolling Stones singing Immanuel Kant. <laughs> That's <laughs> Who a came good up? one. Who's that? That's Ed Freeman of the Twin City A Go Go, nineteen sixty five. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> That, that's rough. That's rough. <laughs> yeah. Plug your gig, sir. OK. Uh, Saturday night, April 1st, April Fool's Day, Johnson Performance Hall, University of Texas at Dallas. And then April 19th, Wednesday, April 19th, starting at eight o'clock. The Dallas gig is 730. Um, wine bar, Steve's Wine Bar in Denton, Texas. It's on Industrial Street. It's a great little venue. We've played there before, and that will be streamed for your listeners that can't make it all the way to Denton. Just uh, go to Facebook Live and put in Steve's Wine Bar, and uh, you'll probably get a notif friend, Steve's Wine Bar, and then they'll send you a notification when that goes live, which is be right at 8 o'clock when we hit. Fantastic. Should sound pretty good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor sir. Professor Mike Steinel. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs>